1 Samuel 16, and we are again doing character studies. I don't know how I can get away with just doing a week on this particular person uh, because there is so much detail. We're trying to, of course, deal with the character strengths and weaknesses of these different people of the Bible. This time it's David. David, his name is mentioned over a thousand times throughout the pages of Scripture. That's more than Abraham, that's more than Moses, uh, other than, than Jesus. It is the greatest story of a person's life uh, with all of its flaws and all of its triumphs that you can find in the Scripture. And probably the most notable thing here is the succession from Saul to David. We were introduced last week to Saul, who was a tragic figure, but nonetheless, he was selected king because the people wanted a king. The nation Israel was kind of jealous because all the other nations had kings and they didn't have a king. And so... God sort of relented to their need for human leadership, but that human leadership was so flawed that God removed his anointing from him, and now he's sending Samuel, the tried and true prophet, he's sending Samuel to um, exercise God's choice for a king, and that choice was David. Now, God's going to have a lot of trouble with David, but he was still God's choice, um, God has a lot of trouble with you, uh, but he still has chosen you. And it doesn't take too long uh, being in the position that I'm in and, and working and pastoring people to realize that they're all sheep who have been led astray and uh, continue with many of those, uh, those ways, but he's still your choice. And so we're going to be in 1 Samuel 16, and now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn Saul, seeing that I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. Now, clearly, for Samuel, who loved Saul, and that's a part of the story that we're, we're not uh, telling to single out David and his individual character. But, but Samuel was a prophet to King Saul, and he was saddened by uh, his rejection. God had rejected him. He had sinned. He had sinned. He had defiled um, the position of king. But it didn't mean that, that uh, Samuel didn't love him. I mean, when you have a, a familial love for a person, it's hard to stop loving even if they stop loving you or stop obeying. And in this particular case, there was a great sadness here. But for Samuel, there was a time to mourn and a time to move on, as Ecclesiastes clearly tells us. And uh, God sets that time. Samuel is mourning, and God decided it's time to not mourn anymore. And one of the things that happen when, what happens when people are in grief and in mourning is that people try to decide when you're done mourning. You know, well, you should be done by now. Uh, well, it's not your choice. It really is between the person in grief and God. And this encounter is a beautiful encounter uh, for those that are in grief and mourning because God is the one that negotiated it. Okay, it's time to go back to work, Samuel. A person can't dictate that for another person. We try to control each other's emotions and each other's sadness, and we can't. And in this particular case, God said, fill your horn with oil. It's time to anoint a new guy. And Samuel, um, who of course was on uh, Saul's side, hated to see him set aside by God, but uh, it was time to get him to go to work. And it wasn't an easy job. It hurt Samuel to have to go and give the, 
saw the news that he had been rejected and dismissed as king. Uh, Samuel's sorrow shows his heart for leadership. And if you've ever been around uh, to see leadership fall, it's a sad thing. A lot of people seem to get some joy out of it. You know, an another person makes a mistake. Another person has a moral failure. Another spiritual leader has another failure. And sometimes people get some you know, twisted internal joy from that. But I got to tell you, it, it, God does not need fewer people to stand up for Jesus. So don't do that, okay? If you got that little, you know, demon on your shoulder that says, ah, I knew it, you know? Flick him off your shoulder. It's a sad thing because those are the people that the enemy targets first. And, and God knows and the enemy knows that less leadership, there's less followership. Less leadership, less disciples. Less evangelists, less people get saved. It disrupts the economy of the kingdom. And so it is a thing to be sorrowful for, but Samuel has to get up and go to work. And as he faces his next assignment, he says, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he'll kill me. And the Lord said, eh, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Now, Samuel is understanding a, a uh, perfectly good fact about the politics of that day. Saul would have considered this treason. There is no question about it. Because Saul is still the sitting king. But Samuel is the prophet, the representative of God, and he now has to humanly go and, and, and uh, anoint another king at the same time that Saul is the seated king, and rightfully so, he would be interpreted, his actions interpreted as treason. So there's a good reason for him to be afraid. Now, it's not unusual for any task that God gives a person to be accompanied by fear. We've already seen this. It's why every time an angel shows up, they say, fear not. Because spiritual business involves fear. Spiritual assignments and tasks involve fear. And so here again, and we'll see it, and have seen it again and again, that these negotiations are not often these glorious times and that, that we think we'll celebrate Christmas and there's the, the wonderful uh, you know, picture of the angel of the Lord appearing to Mary and the angels uh, singing there with, uh, amongst the shepherd. But remember, their message always started with fear not. There's something really big and intimidating coming your way. And Samuel is dealing with it. But he says, take a, a heifer with you and invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one I name to you. Now, as in other cases, the remedy for fear is God saying, I'll show you what to do. Well, I don't know what to do. I'll show you what to do. But I, you want, I want you to show me first what to do. No. And we'll see this again and again and again, where God will guide people in stages. To Philip, go up to the road south of Gaza. Why? I won't tell you until you get there. Because if God had told Philip, you're going to meet one of the most powerful leaders in northern Africa, Philip might have thought, I think I hear my mom calling me. And so more often than not, you know, the guarantee is that I'll tell you what to do, just be willing to obey. Because if he shows you the whole task, you'd, just, you'd shrivel. And it is part of the way that God leads. In this case, God's orders, as with, in many cases that we've already studied, such as Gideon, there's some strategy, there's some planning. God's orders often come one step at a time, and, and here it is. Again, a lot of times people wait to, um, they wait and depend on feelings in order to obey 
uh, tough orders from God. And you'll, you'll fail every time. Because much of the time, the feeling will be, as I've just said, fear. Now, who, who, who responds to fear? I'm going to do this, and I'm scared to death. If you, you know, if, if you yield to just depending on feelings, you'll never get anything done for God. Because the feelings, most of the time, will be negative. If he tells you pack your bags and go someplace and start a church or go on a mission, the unknown in and of itself is enough fear to make you stop. But God has a strategy. And in this particular case, the strategy is get a heifer, which would be normal for a prophet to go to bless a community, because if you back up one chapter, he does really nasty things to a king. And it's a fearful thing for a community to be told the prophet of God is coming to town. So Samuel did what the Lord said. That could be the end of the message. Here's the order. There's the fear. There's the intimidation. There's the promise. I'll show you what to do. And here's the obedience. And there's a four-point message right there. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peaceably? Is there anybody you're particularly angry with today? Now, understand that because of the role of the true prophet of the Old Testament, prophets had some clout in Old Testament times. They could bring a blessing or a curse. And it's an unfortunate thing that spiritual leadership is marginalized today due to the failure of other spiritual leaders. It's unfortunate. Because I think we should have respect for people that are called of God. Called of God to be evangelists. Called of God to be prayer warriors. Called of God to teach. Called of God to pastor. But leadership has been marginalized, and, and, and we can point the finger, uh, but it's, it, it doesn't do any good. Pastors and priests and leaders fail. But I will say I have been to some parts of the country and of the world where a pastor or evangelist is treated with honor. And that, that is the way it, it ought to be. And so a calling of God has a, a certain clout to it that because it's, it's lost and been marginalized, people don't realize what spiritual authority is and what it does when you receive it and accept it. You know, you're a lot more likely to allow the compassion you have for a person to flow out in the form of an exhortation or flow out in the form of a, a personal message or a personal witness you're a lot more likely to do that if you understand that there is a spiritual authority that goes along with that, that it's not your words, it's the words of the Holy Spirit. It's not your words, but it's the words of the Holy Scripture. And so it's, it, we're, we're in, a, in, a ta- in a time where spiritual authority is a little clouded. We want to call everybody that ha- takes any spiritual authority, you know, Uh, self-serving or narcissistic. But it's a powerful thing to say to somebody, I represent God. I don't feel very confident in that. Well, it's not about your confidence. Samuel is taking on a role that God gave him. Certainly he's afraid. Certainly he's afraid of being misinterpreted. You're a traitor if you do this. Socially, culturally, You know, the great mantra of our time is, mind your own business, and we'll obey that every time. Instead of saying, I'm minding God's business, and you're going straight to hell unless you repent. Well, that's rude. No, that's minding God's business. Now, how you say that, and how lovingly you communicate that, and how from the heart, through the compassion, but see, do not shirk spiritual authority. God has called way more people than are responding to that call today. You know, you follow what I'm saying? 
People will stand up and take authority because they're called and anointed and sent by God are fewer and farther between just because they're afraid. They're afraid of being misinterpreted. They're afraid of criticism. You know, the church of Jesus Christ today is full of a bunch of cowards. And it's just the truth. But God's still calling people. And here we are, we've just talked about Samuel being called. We've talked about Saul and his authority being rejected and removed. And now we're talking about that authority being now uh, pre preparing, being prepared for David and Samuel. It's just over and over and over and over again, people being called. Then you get to the New Testament, and it's over and over and over again, Jesus calling human beings to follow him. And we miss how much how big that is, human beings being gifted and filled with the Holy Spirit to do God's bidding. It's very hard to call yourself a Christian and not look around for some calling and anointing on your life. What do you think you are, some dumb sheep? Well, yeah, but you're anointed as his sheep. You're priests and prophets in a holy priesthood. And I've spent my whole life trying to figure out how to shake people loose from the <laughs> dullness of life that comes from not recognizing that. Christian life is not supposed to be as boring as it is for some of you. And so he said, I'm coming peacefully. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Now, it's a little undercover here. He's not telling him, he's not telling them, the people of the community, I'm here to find a king. At that particular point, it would have been a contest. It would have been an issue, like the voice or something. Everyone would have gathered up to, uh, uh, gathered together to audition. And so this was the strategy of the Lord to gather the community together. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. He's explaining himself to the leader of the community. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have refused him, for the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, and the Lord looks at the heart. That would conclude the message as well. The Lord does not see as a man sees. A man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. If there were, <laughs> I'll back up and say it this way. There is no greater form of idolatry in our nation than the outward appearance. It is absolutely worshipped. It is number one. It is the greatest form. Did I say this already? Yes, and I'm saying it again. It is the greatest form of idolatry that exists today. The worship of the outward appearance and how people respond to that. And we would call it self-image and we would call it a number of things. Self-worth and so on and so forth. But it is the greatest idol of our time. And so the statement, the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called the next one in line. Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel and Samuel said neither has the Lord chosen this one then Jesse made Shammah pass by and he said neither has the Lord chosen this one thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel and Samuel said to Jesse the Lord has not chosen these now put yourself in Samuel's place something's wrong he's in the right place 
He's got the community settled. He's not there to, to bring a curse. And he, he you know, is quietly calls together and greets all the families. And he gets to the, the house of Jesse. He's there to do God's business. And the sons start going by. And there isn't anyone that, that matches. There's no witness in his spirit. Some people like to call discernment a check in the spirit. I don't think there's anything wrong with that terminology. Something's wrong. Samuel has a great response. He waits, and he asks a question. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are, are all the young men here? Then he said, well, there remains yet the youngest, and there he is out there keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And so he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise and anoint him, for this is the one. Now what I love about this is, is first of all, David, Jesse doesn't even use his name to describe him. He's the youngest that was, his, that was his role. That's how dad saw him. But he's the youngest. I didn't think you would be interested in him because I've got him pigeonholed. He's not nearly as big and strong and handsome as his, his bigger brothers. And Samuel's thinking, we already did big, tall, and handsome with Saul, and he failed. See, if you remember, Saul looked like he ought to be king. Well, David didn't, so Saul said, I've already been down that road. And Samuel was also very well equipped to understand being called as a young man. So Samuel probably inside himself is just chuckling and said, you, you want to see young, you should hear my story. It started at birth for me. Samuel's thinking. So there's a little disconnect here. Well, sin for him because I don't care how old he is. I know you have made a classic judgment. You see, a lot of people that are called may not enjoy the role of the eldest. They may not be the biggest or considered the smartest. My... my <laughs> My parents uh, he was, could not grasp the idea of me being called to the ministry at 17. My dad would look at me and just laugh. And when I finally brought my ordination certificate and showed him, he said, you're really serious about this, aren't you? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I've been telling you that for several years. You may not have the approval or the recognition or the understanding of your immediate family. It doesn't matter. God had brought Samuel that did understand what it was to be young. And so he said, bring, bring him. He's, I know he's out there keeping the sheep. Bring him anyway, because we're not going anywhere until you bring him. Arise, anoint him, for this is the one, God said. Now, there's a lot that can be said for David's role. Uh, he's keeping the sheep. Now, that meant something very important. It meant that the family was not affluent enough to have servants. If the family was affluent enough to have servants, there would be servants keeping the sheep because it was a lowly job. So it's not a rich family. It's not a priestly family. It also means that David had time to think. Now the reason I say that is that David was very acquainted with the glory of God's creation. He had time to think. He liked the outdoors. I love to sit outdoors. I, I sat where the weather was changing yesterday working on this message. If I can't get to the mountains, my driveway will do. I, just, I, love, I love the outdoors. And David spent a lot of time outdoors. He, he had time for God to build in him a heart 
to sing of his creation. And later he writes Psalm, Psalm 8, Psalm 19, and over and over and over again, David's heart is being prepared. Keeping the sheep meant that he had a special care for innocent animals. As a shepherd, it also meant, as we know from his, his uh, own life story, that he had to, on occasion, trust God and have courage to face the lion and the bear and the wolves that would love to make a meal of his sheep. He had to keep him from harm. Now, there's a lot of speculation on how young, young means. But the youngest call for him to be about 10. The oldest is about 15. So it would be safe to say that David was between 10 and 15 years old when he was anointed by Samuel. And he only knows what 15-year-olds think they know. He has no education yet. He's not an elder in the family. We've already discussed that his father didn't necessarily think he should be there. Um, Ruddy could mean anything. It could mean just fair-skinned. It could also mean he was a redhead. But we know that he was young, good-looking, Probably along the lines of being big and strong, you know, that would be in his future because of his family and his big brothers. And so God starts with a different kind of a a person. I love the fact that, uh, I love the fact that this kind of young man was called and that the Bible is filled with stories of calling. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Now the story changes back to Saul because you have to understand this anointing did not mean that he was being crowned. It didn't mean that he was being made king that day. In fact, that was well into his future. It was something that that had been brewing for a very long time. As David sat out there keeping the sheep. But there is this this time of of percolation. Which I find is often very frustrating when you, you, you know that God has said something, you know God is, is preparing you, and then you think that the preparation means right now. One of the things you have to realize is that yes, not now, is how God answers a lot of prayer. In fact, I think it's wisdom that we understand that you don't always have to say no, you can say yes, not now. You know how, how that can dis you know, uh, that can uh, de-escalate arguments. You don't always have to just say no. You say, yes, not now. And you'll find the Bible filled with yes, not now. I hate that personally. (laughs) And I've argued with God many, many times about that. But see, part of studying this interface between human beings and God is understanding how the character of God interacts with the character of human beings. You follow what I'm saying? And so this is another one of those repeat actions and dynamics that happens where, where there's a promise, but it isn't, I mean, you'd think he saw, I mean, what a great story. Samuel comes and anoints David. What's, what happens now? I'm going to Ramah. Oh, bye. Well, I just want you to know you're anointed to be king. Thanks. What do I do now? Back to the sheep, little boy. Yes, not now. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now this text troubles people. Well, excuse me, what does this say? A distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now the first thing you need to know is God's sovereign. Right? He's in control of everything. But there are other troubling texts 
that say, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. God will sometimes use Satan for a person's salvation. Really? How does that work? Well, first of all, this introduces the important subject of spiritual warfare, which will be woven into the story of just about everybody we talk about in, te- in Scripture. Um, we don't want to talk about Satan. We don't want to talk about the enemy or demons. Like, what in the heck are demons? Well, if you have that question, that's your problem. Understanding what the enemy can and cannot do to Christians in this world, the existence of demonic power and principalities over regions and, and cities and so on and so forth. This is not the stuff for 10-day-old Christians or six-month-old Christians. This is why you spend a lifetime being more than a casual student of the Bible because it gets deep. And sometimes I can't stay always at a shallow level. And in this particular case, it says what it says, and as inconvenient as it might be, We need to talk about it. So, if God is all good, why did he send a distressing spirit upon Saul? Pay attention. There, because this is just a short answer. There are two senses in which God can send something. He can do it actively and sometimes passively. Now, we know from James 1.17 that God never initiates or performs evil. Be clear on that. He is not the author of evil. He is the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Now, passively, God may withdraw the hand of his protection, which is the case with Saul. And therefore, as in the case of Job, Job is a perfect guy. And Satan goes up and negotiates with God. It says, yo, God, your, your servant Job, he, he only loves you because you're so good to him. Now take away some of his stuff, and we'll see what he does. And the drama of Job opens up, the oldest text in all of the Bible, and we see the drama of spiritual warfare based on God giving permission or stepping out of the way, yet controlling the degree to which Job is attacked every bit of the way. All things work together for good. Now that brings up a whole lot of different issues, but if you believe that God is a sovereign God, you'll understand that he may passively withdraw his hand and without that source of protection, Evil will move in. The spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, started the whole drama. Remember I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that about eternal security. We're eternally secure in Christ. Outside of Christ, I'm not so sure. And that brings up the discussion between our trust in God and the fear of God and the awesomeness of God. How much actually does he let us get away with? Well, you have to take that up with God. See, we're always wanting to make little markers and absolutes based on human wisdom and human knowledge and say, this is how far God will go. And I always ask, well, you looked in the mirror this morning and you were God? I looked in the mirror this morning and realized I'm not. So this is an issue in which God will sometimes use the enemy to bring about the best in a person, or in the case of this Old Testament story of Saul to bring judgment. And Saul's servants said to him, Surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. At least he has honest servants who have spiritual discernment. They didn't tell him he was suffering from depression. He's suffering from an attack of the enemy. 
And we have to be able to tell the difference between basic problems in life and mental illness and the other things that come from chemical imbalance and all the other factors that are involved in health, both emotionally and physically, and the fact that there is an enemy who will just all out attack you. And I'm happy for Saul's servants because they recognized, you know, you've got there's bad stuff going on here, and it's the devil. Let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is a skillful player on the harp, and it shall be that he will play it with his hand when the distressing spirit from God is upon you, and you shall be well. Now, even the people of that day knew the soothing effect of music on people. And the reason I'm placing this in and, and selected this particular chapter is it's part of the character of David. It's part of his life. A big part of his life was keeping sheep, which prepared him for being a king. A big part of his life was music that evidently on the hillside for years, perhaps self-taught, he became skillful of hand playing an instrument. And from what um, uh, Psalms reflects, many, many instruments. Um, people then knew the power of music, especially played skillfully by the hand of a person under God's anointing. Now this is a whole other subject that I, as most of you could probably imagine, I've studied very, very thoroughly. God created music and gave it the capacity to touch people with great power. Great power. Now, not everybody is touched by music in the same way. But music has been created by God. It came into the world through Jubal in Genesis and will go out of the world in Revelation when the sound of the harp will be heard no more. But it's something that has been given as a general gift to mankind. It can be used for great good or great evil because it so powerfully connects, so powerfully communicates to our inner being. Now, if you have any questions about this, come and see me afterwards. But it is a gift of God and can be used greatly of the Lord, can be used greatly of the enemy. But even in a general sense, I believe music has been given for our enjoyment. And so throughout the history of man, there has always been evidence of music and dance in every civilization known to history. And it's just a fact. And God decided to make that part of David's character and part of the package that was David. And so here we have it in the context of spiritual warfare, where get, 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 find somebody who plays and Saul won't be as crazy tomorrow if you can. So Saul said to his servants, provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Then one of the servants answered and said, Look, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person, and the Lord is with him. Now, this is a real statement. A mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech. We already know the handsome person part. But where did all that come from? Now, David was young, but I happen to believe that this, this bulky statement tells us that he was probably trained by his older brothers. You got, you got six older brothers that all are, are, in dad's opinion, worthy of kingship. That's a, that's a proud family of men right there. And so the little guy out in the field watching sheep probably learned a lot wrestling with his big brothers, I would think. But he is this package. 
skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech. Now, this whole skillful in playing, David needed skill. He's, in effect, a worship leader. And he is also, in effect, confronting the enemy with a harp. Now, there are Old Testament stories where the musicians go before the army because the music has power. We, we can read that into the story of the fall of Jericho and the trumpeters and, and all this, and over and over and over again. But from a contemporary standpoint, the, it, music can be used to confront the enemy and to prepare people's hearts. One of the great things that, that, that happens to people is a hardened heart can be softened during a worship service. People are influenced by music. Now, I understand this. I understand it because I, 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 I'm not just that I'm a musician, but I, I, I was a record producer for a number of years prior to, to church planting out here. And I had the opportunity to be kind of in the middle of that, and not just the, you know, the devil's music. Because a good friend of mine wrote, a good friend Larry Norman wrote a song, said, why should the devil have all the good music? And that was a mantra of mine, because I thought, I don't think the devil should have all the good music. I think we should save some for ourselves. And when I think of David being good-looking and skillful, and so why should, the, why should the world get everything that's good and beautiful? So I was kind of on a, a roll during a certain part of my young life. And I trained as an engineer. I trained as a, a producer. And part of that, I was an assistant engineer one night on a session for uh, Ringo Starr. It was an a album called Goodnight Vienna. And um, a piano player who influenced me greatly that particular night named Dr. John was on part of the session. And so was John Lennon. Uh, do you recognize the name? There might be some young people in here that do not know who the Beatles are. <laughs> when, my when one of my kids, my middle daughter, was graduating from um, college, Belmont, and she has a, a music business degree, uh, we went out to dinner with uh, all of her, her buddies after graduation and, and got to know some of them. And, and I realized that I was in a different generation when I was talking to one of her friends that, that barely graduated and had to do some makeup work. And I said, well, what, what trouble, what, what class did you have trouble with? He said, the history of the Beatles. And I said, well, what, what was the problem? And he said, well, I, I failed the, the final by one question. I said, what was the question? And he says, what color was the submarine? <laughs> You almost failed college because you did not know the color of the submarine. For those of you wondering what I'm talking about, it was yellow! <laughs> that particular night in the studio was a special, interesting night, because most of the time, if you're an assistant engineer, you're kind of a gopher. You do everything you're supposed to do, and I was kind of uh, Lennon's guitar tech for the night and made sure his guitars were tuned, and you know, it was kind of a big session, so there were a lot of, of us assistant to the assistant to the assistants. But it was the night that Richard Nixon resigned in 1974. And so after that, there was a television in the waiting green room there, and after, after that, the, the um, conversations got very, very serious, and everybody kind of paired up talking about it, and I ended up paired up with Lennon. And we talked for about 20 minutes, and I won't go into the whole situation, but the point was I suggested, because he was saying they're the king, the, these kingdoms, these fiefdoms, the president, and the, he, he, didn't, he didn't think much of uh, the royal family in England, and, and we talked, and I just basically suggested that there was another kingdom coming that was not going to be corrupt, and uh, that was the, the end of it. But the impression I, I got very strongly is that John knew the power that he had over my generation. He understood it. He wasn't obnoxious. He was not demon-possessed. He was about five, eight and a half. I always thought he'd be taller. He was shorter than me. And um, I, I, 
he understood that everything he wrote, everything he said, everything that he and Paul wrote, everything and that they were doing that night had power. He knew that whatever he touched was going to sell a million, million, million copies, and he was comfortable with that power and understood the power of his music for his message. Now, we can call it of the devil, of this, but I, you're oversimplifying if you do that. It's just the general power of music with people that God gave. It can be used for good, it can be used for evil, it can be used neutrally, it can be used just to have a nice groove and a dance. It's something harmless. So I'm not going to, I have a hard time with the straight line between sacred and secular, but I do understand that God created music with a power that moves people. And what that conversation did to me that night is I thought, I'm going to do everything I can with what I know and what I play, and what I write, and the people that I choose to play with, to have that, to the best of my ability, that influence on people for Jesus Christ. Now, uh, I think that's all I need to tell about that story. Um, you know how it is, once you start going, there's a lot more to it, and there are a lot more stories about it, but that... I got close enough to the industry itself to understand how the enemy, the neutrality of culture, and how the Lord can use music, and especially in a situation where a worship leader confronts the evil that surrounds this man. Because, folks, what this means to you is your worship life. Many of you get to hang out with the devil every day. And you need a worship life. You need the cleansing that comes from that kind of, of confrontation between the distressing spirits that affect you all week long and the cleansing dynamic that comes from worship. This church has always believed in the power of music and worship and always will. Um, so That's that. And so the skillful issue doesn't mean that a person has to be a virtuoso before God can use them, but it does mean that you work hard at it and you practice and you don't have a lazy attitude toward it. Therefore, Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David who is with the sheep. And this was the beginning of a long relationship with Saul both for the good and for the bad. And so uh, David was a king. He was a leader, a worshiper, and one of the Bible's most interesting characters. I open with the fact that his name is used more than a thousand times in the pages of Scripture. And we will speak more about him and his life. It's worthy of studying thoroughly. As I was preparing, I I have done in the past several times an entire series on the life of David. Uh, I'm tempted to do that very soon uh, in the future because of of, uh, just what we uncovered today. But it is a life worthy of uh, studying. And here's a little hint, and I'll close. Uh, I don't know if you have a favorite character that you relate to. Uh, as, as ladies, it might be Priscilla of Priscilla and Aquila. She's worth studying. Ruth, uh, Deborah, Mary, Elizabeth, or it could be a, a, a one of the disciples. Uh, I've always related to Peter. I've always related to David. I would encourage you to be open to, to having a favorite character that you study so thoroughly that you wish you were them. Because you're going to find that yourself in many of these, these stories, because that's, that's the reason why we're doing this. I would like to see you become interested in one, maybe more, characters of the Scripture that you relate to and study them thoroughly, because for most of them, not, they're not just in one place in the Bible or just a few verses. They are all over the place. 
And so uh, I would just leave you with that, and uh, we'll be touching on the life of David Moore as we uh, continue through this series. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to, to know and to uh, really concentrate on the, the, the personalities of these individuals and how we find ourselves in their lives. And more than that, Lord, how we find in their lives their interaction with you. Because it is a, it's a model, it's a challenge. Even their mistakes ring true uh, in comparison to our lives. And so I, I pray, Lord, that uh, we, we remain with hungry hearts to, uh, to adopt these people because they were real people having a very real experience with a very real God. And we love you, Lord, and ask that you would bless the worship of this church. In Jesus' name, amen.